if we get one player out of this room that goes and plays 100 league games, that is success. So they're told year on year on year, parents, that that it's not gonna, it's probably not gonna happen. But but we should, you still get that that athletic identity stuff that, that that goes on, and that's for a week of fifty two weeks of the year. The re- the rest of the time, these guys live like a monk, and they're in at that time, and you eat that, and it's 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 a quite a monotonous job, really. It's quite rigid and regimented and all that sort of stuff. So in my opinion, you'll never go back to what they have in in France, where it's kids playing out on the streets and. I lived in Spain for a couple of years and like kids play out on the, on the streets and squares and all that sort of stuff. This country is very different. Okay, so Rob Carlisle, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, my first question is, how did your coaching career start? Um, it, so, it, so it started really when I realised I wasn't going to be a professional sportsman quite, quite early. I uh, was always really into, into sport, especially football and cricket. Um, pl- played sort of um, played both as a kid. Uh, probably realised at about fourteen that I wasn't gonna be wasn't gonna be uh, professional in either of those sports. Um, and then my dad had always been involved in in sort of coaching grassroots football and stuff. So so it's probably ingrained in me that something coaching is something that you do anyway as as a kid. Uh, and then got to about fourteen, fifteen, realised that I'm gonna be a, a professional sports person, sportsman, um, and just started to dip my toe in, really, just helping out my dad with my, my younger brother's team while still playing. Um, at school, I, I was the, the, the captain of the cricket team, played in the football team. Um, one of the PE teachers just sort of must have seen something in me, and, and I ended up in my last two years at school coaching the year seven football team. Right. Um, so year 10 and year 11 so what 15, 15 and 6, 14, 15, 16 sort of coaching and just went from there really and then um, the plan was to be a PE teacher um, so that that was the plan from about 14, 15 years of age that I was going to be a PE teacher because um, I didn't really like anything else I was only really interested in football, cricket, music uh, and my friends and family I wasn't really interested in, <laughs> in anything else so so it just seemed the natural thing. Coaching as a career wasn't really a thing then. Um, so PE teaching was going to be the one that the one that uh, I went down. So I went and studied some stuff at college uh, while continuing my coaching, and then went to university. Um, and coaching degrees didn't exist then, so I did a sports development degree that that had elements of coaching within it. Um, yeah, and really sort of got got into it from there, I suppose. So parents or bring it very influential in terms of you football growing up in working class Manchester yeah, as well in the yeah, environment yeah. such as that 100% um, like my, my dad's absolutely mad keen on, on football um, I can remember going as a, as a young kid um, watching watching people play football and going onto the pitch at half time and kicking a ball around with my dad and all that sort of stuff and the first time I ever went to City my, my dad tells a story that um, I had football under my arm because I was like, well, can't we go on the pitch at half time and have a kick? Because that's that, that's what I've been sort of brought up on the sort of five. I thought I'd go on the go on the pitch at half time at main road and kick a ball into the goal. So just around it really as a kid, yeah. uh, seeing my dad coach, he, he coached my team and then my brother's team. Um, so yeah, just, just around it really from from being really young. What traits do you think you've learned growing up? So you mentioned being exposed to different types of people, different types of environments. Is there anything that you think as you've learned from a young age that has enabled you to transfer into maybe your career within coaching today? I would say sort of from my dad, the, the one thing that, um, by the way, my dad was not a great coach by any stretch of the imagination, but, but he was really keen and really committed. And I think they're probably the two things that, that that I took from it, that you've got to be really keen, you've got to be committed, you've got to turn up, whether in my dad's case, he'd been to the pub on a Friday night and rolled out at three o'clock in the morning and was up for coaching the next got to be committed you got if you're going to do it and you say you're going to do it you've got to turn up come rain or shine really so that'd be one be committed and, and just sort of be in love with it uh be, be in love being around sport and and people playing football all the time and yeah so maybe the two what was your first opportunity in football like then so you mentioned your degree and, and getting educated and not necessarily being open to the wide variety of football degrees that there is today or yeah. sports de- degrees yeah um you, f- you complete your degree and then what what does that trans- transition look like if you wanted to do PE teaching but all of a sudden you're kind of going down this football coaching route so so probably sort of up until me 
my final year at university, the plan was still that I was going to be a PE teacher. Um, and then my, th- my, my final year, I just sort of started to go and do some work for Stockport Council, Manchester City Council, sort of coaching in the community, which was great for me. It, it was, one, you could earn some money from it. So, so, so that was great because it allowed me to sort of fund my next coaching badges. Um, but also just had massive exposure. So I was doing stuff like going out onto parks on a Friday and Saturday night and working with kids who, who were would have otherwise been up to no good, working with uh, kids with disabilities, uh, going to, I can vividly remember working on a, a holiday camp for, uh, for the council and being told, uh, we don't need you here this afternoon. You're going to this other site. You've got to get yourself across there uh, and you're going to do a dance class. <laughs> now, listen, I, I'm six foot two. I've got two left feet when it comes to dancing. I do a little bit of two-step and all that, but but that's as far as it goes. So right out of my comfort zone, and you're thinking on your feet, what am I going to do here with, the, with these 20 kids that are in front of me for dance? So just sort of, you have to become really creative. So so I was thrown into loads of situations that I was uncomfortable with, and, and um, yeah, just really, really helped me after school, clubs, holiday camps, uh, yeah, all that sort of stuff. So, so I was doing that through my third year at university, um, accumulate my coaching badges so, so I've done my level 2 uh, the UEFA C licence now in, in my third year at uni um, and just coaching as I was as I was going really just accumulating hours and different experiences and stuff like that and then um, I ended up going living out in Spain for a couple of years after university come back um, ended up being on the dole uh, so I'm, Lived in Barcelona, me and my girlfriend lived in Barcelona for two years. Moved back to Manchester um, because the recession had bit and we needed to come back. Uh, and then back in my mum and dad's house and uh, both of us on the dole for about three months. And then thankfully, touch wood, an opportunity at Berry uh, Football Club cropped up, um, which was like a bit of a dual role. So I was working within the community. So uh, it was like the, I was the inclusion officer. So all the stuff that I'd done for the council where it was parks and working with naughty boys and girls and disability and boys and uh, girls football and all that sort of stuff. They had a role at Berry uh, that cropped up for that. But then additionally to that, he was working within the academy. Um, So I dropped dropped onto that. So I dropped dead lucky, really, that that almost a perfect role came up for me. Um, So, yeah, I I jumped on that and then sort of never looked back, really. So that was, flipping out, how many years ago was that? 15 years, 14 years, something, something around that. And then, yeah, I've just been involved in coaching in academy football ever since yeah. it's interesting how um you mentioned your journey uh from university degree going to a different culture and then coming back and being on the doll as you yeah. said sometimes it's sometimes we see a career to be from a to b but there's obviously obstacles yeah, yeah. on the road do you feel like that is something that has happened since you mentioned you're entering academy football in terms of your journey sometimes it's you can get um fixated on getting certain certain levels and gamification of qualifications and trying to get from X X to Y and sometimes it doesn't necessarily play out as, as what you think it might play out, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I think if I think if you're if you're involved in it for as long as I've been, you're gonna you're gonna have peaks and troughs throughout and, and I think sometimes young coaches think that, well I'm gonna I'll do that and then I'll do that and then I'll do that and then I'll do that and then, do that, and then mm-hmm. in five years I'll be the be under twenty ones manager at a cat one don't, don't doesn't yeah. work like that. Doesn't work like that. Um, so yeah, yeah, you definitely see the peaks, the peaks and troughs. But I think it, I think it makes you a better coach for it, and it makes you a better person for it. That, that you do have them peaks and troughs, really. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, went, went from living in Barcelona and all that sort of stuff to being on the dole in Manchester for <laughs> for three months. So it's life in it. Yeah. What obstacles have you faced? You mentioned obviously that transition um, going into Berry, but just post. Berry and maybe the other football clubs that you, you've worked for. Is there anything that kind of stands out? It may be your coaching and culture or education. Is there anything that's kind of changed or, or, or modified the way that you see the game and seeing it as a bit of a complexity? Um, I think one of the, one of the challenges for for someone like myself who's not played 500 league games is it, it, the fact that you're not played 500 league games. So, so I think straight away that you're starting, you're starting in some people's eyes on a bit of a lesser footing. Um so that so that is a challenge, and I think the answer to that is just you just got to go in and put on good sessions, and eventually people will buy, will buy into you and, and they buy into the work that you're trying to do. So I think that that's a challenge. Um, 
in terms of the education and stuff like that, I count myself really fortunate to have gone through a system with the FA where there was sort of two distinct sets of courses going on. So there was the, the old school show them and tell them approach, which was through the, the more traditional level one, level two B license. Um, and then the youth awards that have sort of been introduced, that, that were introduced around 2010, where it was a little bit more softer coaching skills. Can you use challenges? Can you use constraints? Can you use, um, yeah, sort of softer skills really to, to, to help the players to develop them. At the time, it was really confusing because you were on you you're on the same course by the organisation. Some people in the same track seat were telling you this, and some people in the same track seat were, tell, were telling you that. Well, actually, I feel really lucky to to have been exposed to all of that, and then you found the tools that that, that, that work for you for the with the plays that you're working with at that particular time. Um, so yeah, that, and that that has changed, and that's now merged much more closely together. So I'm on the FA course is now the they're teaching all of those skills within it, um, which is obviously beneficial. But yeah, to have been exposed to those in two different ways and then have it work it out a little bit for yourself sort of helped me, I think. Could that be a criticism of education in terms of developing good coaches in, in England or even in the UK in terms of maybe just that transparency on what we're trying to achieve and what we're trying to learn? Again, from your, I'm just interested in your opinion on that because you said you experienced it. I think... Listen, there's loads of stuff out there, isn't there, sort of that 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 batters coach education, coach development, and all that, and all that sort of stuff. What I would say is that it's a really difficult job, I think, to to coordinate that in, in terms of if you're delivering a, a level two coaching qualification in whatever sport, you could have twenty five people in the room that 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 are all coming out from slightly different ways and need it for different things, and so so you might have some career coaches who want to go further with it. You might have somebody who um, are on the course because they've been told that they've got to be on the course by the club. There might be people on it that just want to help their um, their young person that's in the that's in the team, and, and the, so to cater for all of that is difficult enough when you're delivering it as a tutor. But you know those people. But then I think for people who are writing those courses who don't know who those people are, yeah. that become, it becomes really difficult. So I think it's I think it's easy to to sort of slate coach education and, and listen there's plenty of stuff out there that, that does do that and and there's some good bits within that that well we could improve but but also i think it's a, it's a you're on sort of a bit of an hiding hiding for to nothing with it as well that, that you can't can't cater for absolutely everything so mm. there's got to be some bits that are that are nipping so and listen we know the government part of their part of their strategy is they want coach education to be more accessible and in short chunks but actually we're asking then people to cover all bases in a short amount of time it becomes really hard, I think. Interesting. Um, in terms of maybe flipping our kind of conversation and thinking about maybe player development and, mm. and, and kind of taking on the qualities and skills from your experiences and your education and applying that within maybe your certain role and your, or your roles within academy. Is there anything that stands out in terms of player development? Is there anything that you think is important in terms of um, bringing out the best out of individuals and enabling them to potentially make it as a as a professional footballer or have a career. Yeah. Well, um, so, 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 I think, so is the is the question around coaches' qualities or players? Yeah. So c- coaches' qualities that enable players to thrive. Number one for me is patience. I think I think that's that that's huge. That that it's not just a a smooth, straight line where they're just going to get... that you have to be patient with them, that the, the kids and um, the learn in the game and, and I just think you've got to be patient and, and see where they're at. Uh, and it might be that they're a big, strong 14-year-old kid who's in a 16-year-old's body, but they're really socially immature. So you might have to be patient. For, so, so I think being aware of all that sort of stuff and... Um, thoughtful around that sort of stuff is important um so so patience would be would be one i think the kids have got to know that you care about them i think that's really important so somebody told me when i first started coaching a cu- couple of things um that one they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care and i think that's really important and two you've got to earn the right to give them a bollocking so i've seen it loads over the years where I'm gonna cut, and it's the old teaching one that, that people used to say, don't smile until Christmas and did it. And, and I just think that's a complete nonsense, mate. That they've got to, 
they've got a, if I go in, so I've just started with a new group now and I've been with them for two weeks. If in the first week I go in and start, you're not doing this and you're like, they're just going to think, who is, who is this idiot here? Uh, and straight away, they just tune off. Not in, so I think you've got to develop those relationships with them and they've got to know that you care about them. On patience, do you think that's a challenge within modern day society? And do you think that's replicated within maybe football? Because I think we're becoming less patient. And you mentioned biological development and maturity, et cetera. Yeah. It's hard to kind of assess where that might kind of drop for an individual. People might grow and develop later. People yeah. want to mature earlier. I mean, I'm intrigued on that. I think we've become better in football at being patient around the physical stuff, de definitely. Yeah. So we've been battering people on coach education courses, be it university or, or uh, NGB awards for the last 15 years about um relative age effects and all that sort of stuff. So everybody everybody knows about that now. So I think we've become more um thoughtful in our approach to it and, and, and think about well actually we might just need to wait for their bodies to catch up a little bit here. So I do think we've become back better in that respect in it, around that. But I totally take your point in society it's a yeah. it's an instant uh we want everything now and but but I do think clubs have become certainly the clubs that I've been involved in have become better at that. Yeah. become better at that what do you think makes say outstanding footballer then so if we kind of modify the question in terms yeah. of what we looked at what, what what things are you looking at as a coach to to kind of pinpoint okay those are the assets that are needed to, to make it to the top yeah so I think um, certainly with the age groups that, that, that I work with the older age groups at, at the club they don't get through they don't really get through to me unless they're, they're technically sound um, so just let viewers know where you're at now. So I so I do I do the under fifteens at uh, Blackburn, uh, and I've been there for this is my fifth or sixth season now. Um, so yeah, I do do the older age groups where they're sort of getting scholarship decisions to go through to under eighteens. Um, so the, you don't really get anyone that comes comes through to us at, at those ages where it's um, where they can't play. Yeah, they're not getting through to us if they can't pass and receive and, and all that sort of stuff. So I think really the ones that we're looking at from from the big one is, are they going to be um, good enough athletically to be a footballer? And are they going to be robust enough psychologically to be a footballer? Um, the, uh, alongside the technical stuff as well. They will they will be the big ones that I, that, that I think that, and there's a really famous uh, quote from the guy who runs Liverpool's academy that talks about um, having the talent will get you through the door, having the right psychological makeup and, and dedication and all that sort of stuff will, will get you a career. And, and I agree with that. That I've seen loads and loads of boys over the years who've got so much ability, but fall down from the application and, and dedication and doing the right things on a day to day basis and almost the monotony of being a professional footballer and I think people you see it don't you in, in newspapers where it's such and such a player I went really sub a week when it when he's out on the out on the source after City won all them trophies that people that that's for that's for a week of 52 weeks of the year the, re, the rest of the time you, these guys live like a monk and they're in at that time and you eat that and it's 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 a, quite a monotonous job really it's quite rigid and regimented and all that sort of stuff so I think sometimes kids cope, they struggle to cope with that a little bit. Um, so yeah, they they be the they be the things. They've got to be sound technically. They got they got to understand the game with, without doubt. But then, I think the ones that that go on and have the the uh, best careers are the ones who have phys are blessed physically, be that agility or pace or um, really strong. I think they've got to have something in in there with them and, and then being psychologically strong enough to, mm. to cope with the demands of professional football. Just on that, um, you mentioned kind of the, the, the welfare element. Yeah. And I think sometimes from from fans, coaches, parents, is that they look at football and it's kind of glamorised as a sport. Yeah. But you kind of mentioned that kind of tedious, repetitive process that can occur. Do you think that brings added pressure to the individual in terms of them trying to achieve a career but not realizing that there is actually a sacrifice, or there is a there is a a, a a kind of regimented process that that's needed to be done to to get to where they need to go, and all these added pressures and identity, etc., kind of layered on top of that. I think it's one of those, isn't it? That they they know 
they know coming into it that, that there are high demands in terms of in the schoolboy program how often they've got to be into training the sacrifices that that they then after that they then have to make but actually that steps up a level when they go to under 18s because it then becomes a job and the, and they're they're being paid to to do that so actually like we we've got it at the minute so, some of the some of the um some of the kids are saying, "Well, I'm not going to be there next week. Cause I'm going on. I'm going on all day. Absolutely fine. No problem. I go go and be a kid. Go and enjoy it. But for these same boys in two years' time, when it's well, my mum and dad want to take me on all day. Well, no, it's pre-season. You're in. It, quite quickly, it, it changes. It becomes it becomes very very different quite quickly. Um, so I do think that I do think that that is a challenge for them. Yeah, I do think that is. A, and you better if you speak to some of, some of the colleagues who work in the PDP, uh, the the older age groups that. It's probably one of their biggest challenges for the lads who come in as a first year that they've moved away from home, so they're living in they're living in digs. They're there six days a week, and they get to go home one day a week, and that's if they if they live in the northwest. It's really regimented in terms of breakfast is at this time. It's it's, it's quite it's quite drilled and it's quite structured, and some people thrive in that, and some people find that really difficult and um. Yeah, so, so I do think that there's some challenges around that. It's just interesting because obviously um, yesterday that Delhi Alley recording came mm. out and I think that kind of epitomises everything you said in terms of that regimented structure but how actually it can impact uh, individuals in terms of maybe well-being and how they cope yeah. with certain demands, etc. It's just interesting to hear your, your thoughts on that. Just to add to that then, so in terms of culture uh, and setting a good culture that enables factors like that to be uh, appreciated and, yeah. and respected, Um what do you think sets a good culture there? So from your experiences at Blackburn and other football clubs, what do you think sets a good culture to enable players to thrive or players to open up about their feelings and other things that are relevant to the development of an individual? Good people. I think uh, there are all these loads of other facets to it, but ultimately it comes down to having, having as many good people in the building as you can um, who, who put the put the players first and uh, and all that sort of stuff and Blackburn's a wonderful club for that. They've got loads and loads of really, really, really good people in the in the building. Um, the the club, they've got people there that have been there for a long, long time in, in different roles and they talk about them. Blackburn, but I know the, the, the sort of academics talk about them being as like the custodians of the culture and, and they've got probably five or six of them at Blackburn in different roles, not not all coaches, some some of the education department, stuff like that, who, and the sports science departments and stuff who embed that embed that sort of culture really and, and new people who come into the club sort of have to adopt and uh, and they show them that this is the way that this is the way that we do things really do you think that comes from a, a top down approach then so you mentioned good people but is that kind of people in leadership positions or is that lead people um, in different types of roles I'm just intrigued on a little bit more detail on what you mean by good people in yeah, that just just the so the, yeah good people Good people at the top, but, yeah. but I think they get pulled in all different directions, different meet. So you can you can have a top down culture where it's this is the way that we do it, but but that only that's only as strong as the people who are actually living and breathing it day in day out. And, and so so yeah, I think it has to come from the top, but it has to be filtered throughout the throughout the the, the processes uh, throughout the sort of system as well, and um. From the full time, the other full time staff who were there into part time, part time lads like myself. We mentioned kind of the nature of, of good culture and good people. Um, have you had experiences with good coaches that enabled you to kind of learn and develop? Is there anyone that stands out in terms of your journey around mentor, being a, uh, anyone that mentored you or anyone that kind of enabled you to grow as an individual and make you think about the game differently? Is there anyone that stands out across that? Yeah, listen. I, I, when I was at Berry, I was re- I was really lucky to work with. Um, I, I was a young coach I, I, at Berry. I was probably how old was I? Twenty twenty two, something like that. Um, I, I, and I got the job working in the academy at Berry, not being really ready for the job, if the truth be told. And I, I got given an opportunity that that I probably wasn't ready for. But there was a guy there called Alan Moore who who um, was absolutely brilliant, uh, brilliant with me. It, I couldn't sort of fault him. He, he um, was hard on you when he needed to be hard on you. Uh, was um, always an ear to to listen. Would take the Mickey out of you, but but you could you knew that he that he thought something of you and that he wanted to help you get better. 
Um, my dad was going like, uh, like I said before, I was I was the working in the community, but I was doing the, the academy stuff as well, and that, that that sort of continued. But my dad was going with the reserves, like he'd be the reserve team manager. He'd like come to come to altering with us tonight. We've got, we've got a so you got you in a changing room with senior pros at twenty two years of age when, like, really I'm, I'm fan finding it a challenge looking after our under tens and so just exposed to loads of stuff and that was probably the best thing about being at Berry that I'd be I was probably coaching what 30 hours a week so I was doing I was I was doing assisting with the under 16s with, with Al um I was doing a couple of age groups one leading the tens and then helping out with another with another group uh I was running the disability team I was I was just I was just immersed in it I was probably involved in about five or six teams at the time and I was just living and breathing it every day, so so it was brilliant. So so Al was great for me. He, he was really really good. Um, I worked with a guy who's now the academy manager at um, Ipswich, a guy called Dean Wright. So so me and Dean um, of a similar age, we we were at our similar points in our sort of coaching sort of coaching journey, uh, for want of a better phrase, and we just sort of really pushed each other on and and sort of. He'd look at my sessions, I'd look at his sessions, and he'd, well, what, what are you thinking about that? I'm like, so, so that really worked for us. And then um, Dean worked for me at Berry. I worked for him at Uddersfield. Uh, and, and then he moved from from Uddersfield down to Norwich uh, as the head of coaching. And he's now the academy manager at, at Ipswich. So Dean was another one who was, uh, I think we were good for each other. Uh, and then, as I said before to you, a guy who was really influential on me was um, my cricket coach from when I was a kid. So he's a guy called Martin Leach. Now, Martin, he might have done his coaching badges. He might not. I, th- I think he had done some coaching badges. Um, he was a sports journalist, so so he was mass- mad keen in sports. Um, and like the thing that I took for him, mate, was I, I was a pretty ordinary cricketer, really. I, I was all right. I, I, I was okay. You turn up to training with thirty other thirty other lads. First, first team and second team training, because in cricket you sort of as a fourteen year old kid you're, you're probably playing for the second team with blokes, and you turn up and it'd be like Rob, how are you? Did it? And it was like he was my individual coach, but he was thirty people's individual coach, mm-hmm. and he just made you feel so so special, like that that you were the most important person there, and I, I, and I took that from him, and and it's something that I try to sort of. Make every player that's there feel important. Now he he knew that I was probably not as good as some of the other ones there, but he wanted to push me to be as good as as I could be to 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 meet my ceiling, for want of a better phrase. But he would he did that with everyone. So so I, I bowled a little bit of spin and, and I batted, and he made you feel like he bowled like Shane Warne and batted like Brian Lara, even though I was a pretty ordinary. Uh, but that's how he made made you feel. Like it was just. He, he had an incredible gift. Uh, uh, he might had it. He was a good technical coach as well, by the way. But he wasn't just a flowers and bells and all. But but he made you feel like he, like he was on a different level, mate. And, and I tried to try to use that and make the players sort of feel a little bit like that. I'm not saying it's you're fluffing them up and all that sort of stuff. So if you'd not done what what he'd what he'd um, what he felt was your level, he'd let you know. But he he had a great knack of like he thrown your wicket away there today. He's a really poor shot. You've been out a couple of times like that. So the next time you see him, right, come on, what we're we doing now to to correct that? Uh, he, he was just not that he'd knock you down because he because he wasn't like that. But but he'd he'd tell you that he wasn't right, and then it'd be the next time you see him, he'd be like, right, come on, let's pick it up now. And I think that's a real real gift for that uh, on that. So. How how do you relate that to your own practice then? If those are the transferable skills that you use within your own coaching, how do you know when to to maybe be be a little bit tough on players, or use the cold shoulder on players, or be open and fluffy as as the word that you said? How do you know when to bring that balance in? Is it instinctive? Is it no? I is think, it learned? I'm, I'm intrigued. No, I've, uh, well, I, th- I think you develop it through experience, and and there's been some times in the past where you think flipping echo. I wouldn't have done that. And I can always remember being at Berry. Like when I first started, when I first started coaching, and there was a lad in midfield, done a terrible, terrible tackle, like a like a, a shocker, two two foot in the eye, and I go, whoa, sub off, and, and he was probably an eleven year old kid at the time, he's come off absolutely heartbroken, 
Now, I still probably would have taken him off, but my reaction on the side, because it was a shocking tackle, w w was a poor one, really. So it was probably my job to educate him, but but I, I didn't think about it. I had a sort of an instinctive reaction. So I think you learn on the job around it, but getting to know the players, and, and you'll know certain ones who who need an arm around the shoulder. So if I... If I dig them out in front of the group, that ain't gonna that ain't gonna go down particularly well. You you need you know that there's some within the group who can take that sort of thing, but you might give a message to you that's for the whole group, but it's directly it's directed directed at you. Um, but I'll go back to my point before: you've got to earn the right to give them a bollocking. So, so I think you've got to, for me, you've got to build up that that re rapport and relationship so that they know that when you do have a little bit of a that ain't right, that you're not good enough for that. That they know it's coming from a good place and, and they know that that you've got the back, I suppose, and that, that you just want the best for them and demand that from them a little bit. So I think building those relationships are absolutely key. In terms of building relationships as well with parents, is there anything that you you try and do within your practice to to develop parents' education? Because I can imagine that they are determined and the reason I ask this I'll, have you watched the Crystal da uh, Palace I've seen bits of it yeah. I've seen bits of in it in terms yeah. of parents being too pushy and yeah. Project Mbappe and all these different things that are apparent at the moment uh, what, what, how do you deal with that in uh, terms of the pressures and the the nature of football in yeah, modern day it's a good question that so, so through my time it's, it's really changed your relationship with parents so when I was at Berry. You knew all of them. You knew all, all of the names. You knew uh, what job they did, did all, all that sort of stuff. And one that was probably the nature of the club. So they didn't have, they didn't have. Um, well, well there was probably about four of us that ran the program. Yeah. Um, so we had to do everything, washing the kits and all that sort of stuff. Um, but then player care roles have come in, education roles have come. So, so you're a little bit further removed now from. From the parents, so there's that work that goes on. But as a part-time coach, I'm not privy to, so I don't have to deal with the parents' loads and loads. It's other people who are in sort of management positions that that do that. And listen, we have conversations with them and all that sort of stuff. But but yeah, I'm not I'm not directly educating the the, the parents. Um, yeah, I'm not that that isn't sort of something that that we do uh, anymore. Really, we we used to, but it's, it's sort of changed over the last. I don't know, six or seven years, I would say. What are your thoughts on that in general, anyway? Obviously, I don't know if you've seen No Hunger in Paradise, the yeah. documentary as well as the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just kind of looking at early specialisation and all these yeah. factors. Is, is, have you got any opinion on that that could be shared? What, in terms of? Just the, the, the development of young people. Uh, parents are kind of a facet to that in terms of making sure that they're aware of the process. But, you know, these pressures, as we kind of mentioned, and burnout and diversification seems to be apparent especially at yeah, your age yeah how has that changed in terms of maybe your development as a as a coach and and obviously the development of football i think you you just sort of i'm really wary I, not wary that's the wrong word i'm aware that these kids are put uh, that are, that are that i'm working with are in a situation that, that that's not really normal that they're in with us four, five times a week and they're doing their education and they're trying to be a normal teenage teenage boy and um the, the big the big bit that they're probably missing out on is being being the normal teenage boy, really. Um because the school won't let them come to us if they're not doing what they should be doing at school and the club won't let them come to us if they're not doing what they should be doing at school. So they can't neglect the school work. So probably the bit because it's only so many, so many hours in a day is the the normal teenager stuff. So I, I'm always conscious that when we do have a bit of time off, my parting bit and the lad start rolling their eyes towards the end of the season because I say that often. So it's like it's going to be a normal teenager for a week. Don't don't be like don't be sending me clips on Uddle. Don't be just, yeah. just go and be go to the Trafford Centre with your mates or do whatever you do is uh, go to the cinema or so. I think you just have to try and when they do have those windows of opportunity, sort of encourage them to to do that um i think in terms of the early early specialization stuff the research suggests one thing that the system is something else you are going to change the system but the, the system is as the system is because um 
like it or not, football is now a multi-billion pound business. So if, if they were to change the model over here, then somewhere else might change their model. So so I think there's all that sort of stuff that that, that has a knock-on effect. So I think the, the job now is to make to create a system that is as child child friendly as it as it can possibly be. So we'll go back to the bit where one of the kids say we're going on holiday or I'm not coming to because I'm at a birthday party. Yeah, go and enjoy yourself. Go, go and enjoy yourself. That, that's really important. Um but yes it's difficult. It, it is difficult. I'm sure parents do feel the do feel the pressure. Um I also think there's a danger sometimes, you know, with the Crystal Palace stuff that there's a bit of academy bashing that goes on in the in the press and the media and all that sort of stuff. And I think clubs do a really good job around educating parents. And what do you mean by academy bashing? What, what like, mean? oh, academies don't do this and they should do more of that. And right. the, so, so I do feel, I personally feel that that, that academies in the in the the press and the media and and sort of in wider society they, they, they get a bit of unfair stick in my opinion that that um especially around the release stuff I think the certain the clubs that I've worked at have been really good around that release stuff and they they help the players and they move the players onto other places and make sure they've got that that support um but yeah I, I just think that that, that sometimes it, it's it, clubs are the easy target is what I'm trying to say uh, and I think there's there's loads of other elements to it that in my opinion, so I've got two young lads. If 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 they ever go into that sort of system, I personally think it's my job to make sure that they're doing the school work. And you you're not a footballer; yeah. you are a person who plays foot. That that that's that's my role as a parent. I think the clubs can play a, a part to that, but I don't think it's the club's job to make them realise that. And the parents are, come on, you're going to be the next name, are you? You're going to be. I, th- I think that that's a. I sat in probably fifteen welcome parents meetings where. The, the academy manager or head of education or player welfare, whoever whoever it is, has sat there and gone, if we get one player out of this room that goes and plays 100 league games, that is a success. So they're told year on year on year, parents, that that it's not going to, it's probably not going to happen, but but we should, you still get that that athletic identity stuff that, that, that goes on. And I don't know how you change that. I'll, I'll be honest, I don't know how you change it, but... Um, I don't necessarily think it's just the club's responsibility. Um, I think it's probably 80% parents and 20% clubs, but I think sometimes in the media it comes across as it's maybe the other way around or 100% clubs and, yeah. and no no percent parents, just my opinion. Yeah, to, just uh, to my next question was kind of going to relate to that point in terms of any flaws within maybe academy systems, but just, just on that, is there anything you think else stands out in terms of things that could be improved in terms of the, the system or anything that you think is, is more relevant going forward to, to ensure that players are protected, coaches are protected um, in terms of just making the whole system better and, and creating a, a a welfare process, but also technical and tactical development yeah. that enables us to compete at the highest level as well as social as well. Yeah, it's, it, it's really challenging, isn't it, that... that They've done really well for the last few years in terms of producing players, and uh, and since each each of inception, you're starting to see the fruits of the fruits of the labour. Under twenty ones winning last week and plays in the first teams and the, uh, and all that sort of stuff. I don't, I don't know in terms of improvements. I think one of the big challenges that that I see, um, certainly in the in the in the eyes of parents potentially and, and, and others is the extra stuff that goes on away from the, the club so you see it now on social media that this is X, XYZ player that comes in from uh, fr- from this club and they're doing three nights a week extra with one to one coat I do worry that it can become quite an uh, almost an elitist sort of sport so if you take Marcus Rashford as, as an example as a kid from Withenshaw who went into United and all that sort of stuff. Kids from Wivenshaw now, do, do they think, well, if I've got a chance of being a, a, a footballer, if they're in if they're in a system, I need my mum and dad to be sort of getting me an additional um an additional coach to do three sessions a week with me extra at, at fifty quid a throw. Do you know what I mean? That that quite quickly it can become it can become if you've got a few quid you can that you can throw at it that they can get some extra stuff. It concerns me a little bit that. It does concern me a little bit. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know what the don't know what the answer is to it. Do you think that might relate to what we said earlier in the podcast around kind of that burnout process and that limitation in terms of socialisation yeah. with friends and letting kids be kids so have potential, mate? Yeah, kind of it's, it's, it's challenging, isn't it? It's really challenging. Um, we were dead fortunate um, to, to listen to a guy, um, Joe Sargison from from the FA, talk about what they do over in Argentina, um, and he was talking about that actually they do miles more than us over here. But in my head, Argentinian culture and lifestyle and uh, and all that sort of stuff mm-hmm. is quite different to to, to the, the the culture and lifestyle over here. So we are we are now a really really busy society, uh, and it's to go there and, and the rush 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 around. Not that I've ever been to Argentina, but the impression that I get there is that they do the football, but then outside of that, everything else is a little bit more relaxed and calm. Whereas I think modern society over here is that. They're really intense at the football, and they need to be really intense at the football. Mm. Schools are on the case, and there's just loads of other expectations around the around the kids that they've got to be absolutely brilliant in all these different facets of the life. And yeah, I do worry with the burnout and mental health being a big thing and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. How, how does that impact upon them? Um, which is one of the other reasons why I think it's important that you the kids going back to the coaching and the way that I try and coach is kids know that you're on their side I think that's really important because if they don't think that, that then straight away the mindset's completely completely different in it it's interesting you mentioned models and you mentioned Argentina um, I think there's a case in France as well where they, I think the, the, in Paris the street footballer yeah, yeah. kind of atmosphere and, and that enables players to, to, to become professional footballers south of the river as well I don't know if you come across that in yeah, so you, community yeah. in, yeah, in yeah. south London Um do you think that's hard to replicate then in terms of education? So you, you, you might get you might get different football clubs or different organisations look at different countries and what they're doing to, to bring the best into yeah. England and the UK. Easier said than done in terms of developing that transparency yeah. if you look, and looking at those models. If you look historically, mate, that that up until 2016 when, when England brought in the, the England DNA stuff, the English FA brought in the England DNA. Really, it had been in 19, 1998. Oh, let's have a little look at what France do because they must be good because they won the World Cup. 2002. Oh, let's have a little look at Brazil because, uh, but, but we're in France and we ain't Brazil and uh, it's, it's just just very different. That, in my opinion, you'll never go back to what they have in, in France where it's kids playing out on the streets. And I lived in Spain for a couple of years and like kids play out on the, on the streets and squares and all that sort of stuff. This country is very different. It's very, it's very, very different. That, and I don't think you'll ever go back to that. Think about when I was a kid. We, we were able to go out and play on parks, and you got to be on by x x time to 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 have your tea and all that sort of stuff. My two little lads, I'm not, I'm not sure whether they'll be doing that when, when they're seven and eight. That you just they're out and you don't know where they are and all that. I just don't think that that will ever, will ever come back in this country. But in other countries, that that does still happen. So it's how can you replicate some of that stuff that, that's important that they're doing there, that unstructured play, but probably in a formal environment. Um, and there's quite a bit of quite a bit of stuff that's been done around that. Um, Paul McGuinness is a really big one for, for that, talking about, and Pete Sturges at the FA talking about bringing play into formal environments. I do think that that's really important. That just where else did you get it? Yeah, definitely. Paul McGuinness is actually a guest next week. He's ex, so maybe we could kind of, so maybe we could uh, ask him those questions. What well, is interesting. I think, I think our nature as well, and this is my personal point of view, is that um, our society is quite aggressive in some sense, and that's where the physical element kind of comes into play a little bit in terms of his historically, um, and that, that I think I think that kind of aligns with that kind of persona of the English Premier League's always been physical in that, but actually it's changed over time. Um, I think it's become physical in a different way. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm trying to hint at. I think it's become more. The game is fast. Mm. The, the game is, is still really, really fast over here. But mm. it's a stereotypical point of view. That's what I'm yeah, trying to say. But, you know, but, but I think there's still a physical element to the English game. Mm. But but actually, I think it's gone towards more being big and strong and too quick and dynamic and changing the directions really quickly. And yeah. I think that that's certainly since I've been going to football. I think this last season that's just gone was my thirtieth season. Going to going to. Um, Football matches, it, it's that has been the big change for me. That it's, that it's gone from being really physical and it's about power and ag- 
not power, strength and aggression. So now it's more about being dynamic and quick changes of direction and, and those sorts of things. And when I talk about physical development, they're the things that I'm I'm thinking about. Yeah, and yeah, to, be, yeah, yeah. to be quick and dynamic and, and agile. On on that then, so kind of kind of coming towards the end of our interview, in terms of your experiences that you spoke about and the um, different situations, contexts that you've been exposed to, what advice would you give to coaches that might be listening or watching to this that are thinking about going down the route of coaching, want to see it as a career? Yeah. What advice would you give to them? Um, what advice would I give give to them? Uh, you've got to be, you've got to love it. Yeah, it, you, you've got to love it because it is unsociable hours. It's outside. So if you're a football coach, it's, it's outside. So you can't look at them and go, it's one degree and chucking it down in the north. Don't really, fan, you've, got, you've got to be reliable. So if you go back to what I was saying before that I learned from my dad, if you're going to do it, you've got, you've got to do it. Um, find an understanding partner. I think, and, and, and people might think that's a... a, a I wouldn't be able to do the job that that I do and the commitments that I have if I didn't have an understanding wife, um, because it does take up your your weekends and your evenings and uh, and all that sort of stuff. That is, that is the nature of the job. That is the nature of the job. Um, I think you just got to keep plugging away. Just got to keep plugging away. That let you, let your good work on the pitch do the talking for you. Um, be a person that if you want to go into academy stuff, be be, be a club that. Be a person that clubs want in the building. So don't be the uh, energy sapper, be the energy giver. Yeah, I think, think that's really important because it's easy to go in and mm, that's mm, that. be thankful of how lucky you are to work in that environment. I, 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 it's a long way for me to drive up to, to Blackburn. It's an 84 mile round trip for me. And every time I go in, I think, what a great environment to be in. Staff are great, kids are great get placed through the first it's a re feel really fortunate to work in that sort of environment but, but actually quite quickly people f can think chucking it down draining brr, I've driven all this your mindsets that I think I think's really important um just keep plugging away at it keep plugging away at it get better at the things that you're good at and work on your weaknesses what's that feeling like when you see a player go and achieve their potential that you've coached brilliant mate work with what's it brilliant. describe it makes all the late nights and uh, motorway diversions where you're thinking, I'm going to be home in 10 minutes and <laughs> junction shut and you've got to get off. And uh, times when, you, when you're at a, uh, a bit of a family party on a Saturday night and it's like, it gets to about 11 o'clock, you're like, I need to go here because I've got to be up to go to West Brom away tomorrow. Like, it just makes it worth it. Just makes it worth it. But, but the flip side to that is that the other thing that makes it worth it for me is like kids who don't go on to have a, a professional career who stay in the game and still love the game. So um, got lots of lads now who worked with 15 years ago at Ferry who were, who, who were playing, who were what, 11, 11 at the time, who were playing in the Northwest Counties for, for different different clubs. Um, I went to one on Easter, Easter Monday to watch two, two lads who played against each other. Uh, two lads who played in the same team play against each other. So that, that was great. I loved that. And then the other thing that I really enjoy is like just lads who you've coached in the past do search you out on social media. And say, oh, do you remember me, coach? I really enjoyed it. I think that as well. That It's not just about the lads who go and make it into the first team. It's it's the other ones as well. And I think, I think that's really mm -hmm. important. Like, my missus is a school teacher and she comes home and she's like, the youth of today, the... Da -da. And I and I always say to her, do you know what? If I was a business owner, I can probably count the amount of lads on one hand who I've worked with over over the years. Probably six, seven hundred lads who I wouldn't give a job to. Like the, the br brilliant, brilliant kids, absolutely brilliant kids. Turn up on time, hard working, organised, committed, uh, good senses of humour, can stand up in front of people and speak. Like it, it, what employment on them? working for him I think that I think that when I talk about academy bashing that's the other stuff that people don't that don't see that parents give them that as well by the way I'm not saying the clubs do, do all that but but cl clubs help to mould these young people into sort of good functioning members of, of society and, and while I still get the buzz of lads 
breaking through to first teams and representing the country internationally. That, that, that's brilliant. That's that's what you do it for. You equally do it for for the other side of it as well. The the, the good lads. I think that's sometimes missed in terms of going into an academy environment. That the the, the the target is always to make it as a professional footballer, but there's also these intricacies in terms of developing soft skills and employability skills that might be transferable from football into other avenues. Listen, if, if you're judging me on the quality of my work, on the amount of lads that have gone on to play professional football for, for a sustained period of time, over a 15-year career, probably about 25 or 30 out of 700 lads. So if it was just about that, I would be failing miserably. But I think that's the other side of it. It's about it's about helping them. It's, it's a cliche, and it? it it sounds like a like a bit a bit of a, an American thing. But like we want to make them into good people. But you do. You just you're trying to you're trying to help develop them into into good, hardworking, industrious, nice people who you won't mind if they moved in next door to you. Like, do you know what I mean? But I, th- I think that's a big part of it. Absolutely. Certainly, the age groups I work with. So, final question, Rob. Yeah. What I tend to do with my guests is either to get them to, to look back or look forward, but with you, I'm going to get you to look forward. If you were to maybe finish your career and yeah. kind of put your feet up and go, yeah. that's my part done within yeah. football, what do you kind of want to be remembered by? What do you want, want, to, want to leave behind in terms of your, your coaching and your methods within football? Um, it's interesting, this. So just this just this week, me... me, me uh, my mum passed on my old school reports, so she was. I think she had a clear out home, so she passed passed on my school reports. And and the one thing that I, having looked through them, the the bit that I remember was, see, oh, he he was he, he was decent. Him, I, I like, I liked him. He he helped me, and, and I think that'd be it for me. That 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 come the end, regardless of where the, the kids played at, whatever whatever level, that in 10, 15, 20 years time, that that they remember you and go. He was all right, Rob. He, he sort of he had me back. He tried he tried to help me. He sort of really put a bit of time and effort into me. And yeah, we had we had a good time with him. We had a good season with him at, at that age. And I think if you do that, you'll not be too far wrong. I don't think. Well, I don't think you'd be too far off it. Mm. Right. Excellent. All right. Yeah, uh, Rob. Where can listeners or viewers find you if they're in, interested in, in learning more about you or finding out about your um, your career? So I'm on I'm on, I'm on Twitter. Um, I don't know my handle, but Christy will put it on the on the uh, description. The description. <laughs> uh, I'm having a hiatus from from LinkedIn at the moment. I'm, I'm having a little rest from it. Um, just for any reason? Just, just like just get some nerves after a bit. Um, so okay. I'm having a little rest in it. Um, sorry, I know you promote this through LinkedIn, but yeah, I'm just having a little rest. Um, yeah, and then my UCFB email address, which is uh, r.carlisle at ucfb.ac.uk. Perfect. Rob, thank you for your time. Thanks for having me. Mitch. Interesting story. Uh, and again, something that we can all learn from in terms of your experiences. And good luck with Blackburn. Thanks. And hopefully the uh, the future is bright for you in terms of your coaching as well. Trust me. Thank Cheers, you. Pal. Cheers.